Well, we are finally here. I've been talking about it so much, and now I get to talk even more about it. But we're finally in Genesis. Uh, we finished our series in the book of Acts. Uh, and Acts actually does continue on after chapter 16. Uh, so feel free to go and read the rest. It's an excellent book. Um, but that's just the series we chose to do. So now we're in uh, Genesis. And uh, it's funny that I made that mistake because while writing this, every time I wanted to write down a Bible verse, I was like, Acts chapter, no, no, I had to delete, 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 delete. Genesis. Act, no, it, it's, I kept catching myself. I just, and now I'm saying it verbally. So it makes it even better. But finally, we're here in the book of Genesis. And I know that you are just on the edge of your seat. And you cannot wait to hear all about it. Trust me, I am too. Or at least I'm on the stage of my pulpit and stage. That's where I'm at. I'm very excited about this. But I want to remind you, before we jump into these Bible verses, before we jump into this book of the Bible, I want to remind you that we are 2,000 and some odd years away from the events of Jesus' life. Okay? So 2,000 years since like the end of Jesus's, or excuse me, the beginning of Jesus's life. Okay, not only that, Old Testament goes back way further than just that. It's thought that Genesis, well, it's theorized that Genesis was written approximately 1,445 BC. Okay, and that's just when Genesis was written. That's not when the events of Genesis took place, okay? And I say that for a specific reason. I say that because this culture back then is very different than our culture. The way that they thought about things, the way they communicate ideas, it's very different than what we do. We very much like to be able to turn on the news, look at the bullet points, the factual bullet points of what happened. All right, cool. End of story. Done. But that's not how Genesis is written. And really, that's not how the whole Bible is written. The idea or the way that they communicate back in this time is they paint a picture, so to speak. They tell you a story. They, they give you an account of what happened. So if you're looking for a bullet point summary of what happened, you're not going to get that. <laughs> That's not how they wrote back then. Moses is the one who wrote Genesis. And um, just because they communicate differently than what we're used to does not mean it's not valuable. It does not mean that it's not profitable for us. In fact, uh, the first verse I want us to go through is 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 50, or verse 15. And you don't have to flip there in your Bible. It'll be on the screen. But this is really important. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. And he says, and you know that from infancy, you have known the sacred scriptures, okay, speaking about the Bible, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, the reason why I want us to look at this verse first is to communicate to you guys the Bible is not, it's not a science book, okay? It's not a textbook. It is literally trying to communicate spiritual truth to us to make us wise for salvation. That is the idea behind the Bible. Now, that's not saying that there's not scientific truth in the Bible. It does communicate scientific truth, but that's not the end goal of the Bible. That's not what, when Moses is writing that down, he's not like, ha, ha, ha. When they uh, invent the scientific method, they're going to have so much fun with it. You know, that's not at all what he's thinking, okay? He's communicating spiritual truth, okay? As Paul said about Scripture, uh, all of it is profitable for us. It is God-breathed. It is inspired by God. What does that mean? It means that God, when he wanted to communicate to us, he chose men to write down what was going into the Bible, okay? Uh, and, and it's not like they were writing like, oh, I'm going to write the Bible. No, usually, like Paul's a great example. He wrote letters to other churches. God selected Paul, used his personality, his interests, uh, all kinds of things that made Paul and worked through that to write scripture, okay? And so how we would say is we hold a verbal plenary view of scripture, okay? All scripture is good for us to read. It's all God-breathed, okay, within the Bible. So, 
as I was preparing for this sermon, I was reading through the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, Study Bible. And I came across this quote that I really like, and it's not going to be on the screens. It's, it's fairly short. But it says, Genesis permits us to view the beginning of a multitude of realities that shape our daily existence. The creation of the universe, planet Earth, the origins of plant and animal life, the origins of human beings, marriage, families, nations, industry, artistic expression, religious ritual, maybe it's not such a short quote, prophecy, sin, law, crime, conflict, punishment, and death. Okay? So, all of these fundamental beginnings we get to see here in Genesis. Okay? So, Genesis is a Greek word. It means of birth. Okay? The Hebrew name of this book is In Beginning. Okay? I think that's pretty good. Pretty good title considering what it shows us. Okay? Now, again, it's important to note, as I did earlier, the events of Genesis happened a long time ago. Okay? So again, very different culture than ours. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and open up Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. So again, listen to what Scripture is speaking to us here, okay? So let's go ahead and read. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day. And the darkness he called night. There was an evening, and there was a morning. One day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters separating water from water. So God made an expanse and separated the water uh, under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse sky. Evening came and then morning, the second day. Okay? So this process continues on for several days. God is creating literally time, space, matter, I mean, it's mind-boggling that God just speaks and suddenly light photons exist. Like, that's crazy to me. But that's how great our God is. So then he creates the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea. And after every day, God steps back and looks at his work and he says, this is good. This is going well. I like this. This is good. Finally, we arrive on the sixth day. And then God creates livestock, creatures that crawl, wildlife of the earth, according to their kind. And God steps back and he says, this is good. I, I like where this is headed. This is great. I imagine God standing on a mountaintop looking over his work and enjoying it. And the picture that's being painted here is a God who enjoys to create. And he enjoys the beauty of his creation. Okay? I just imagine him standing over like a lush, I don't know, a lush forest. Or maybe, maybe the Rockies of Colorado. I don't know. You know. Who knows where he was? But just looking over these landscapes and just enjoying what has been created. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So, God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Okay? Now, we're getting into some like Hebrew literary structure here when you start looking at this. And you see him repeating this three times. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And it's like, man, we get it. You, you've said that. Okay? But in Hebrew, when they're trying to highlight something for you, because they didn't have highlighters back then. You know, they didn't have, uh, it just didn't work that way. But to highlight something, to show you that this is important, you should be paying attention, commit this to memory, they will repeat things in three uh, three times, OK? 
Okay? So when you're reading the Bible and they repeat something back to back to back three times, that's your cue. Oh, this is something very important, and I need to make sure I understand what's being said here. Okay? Now, this is the best part, in my opinion. I love this, that we are created in the image of God. This is such a rich topic here. Um, Literally, because of this, this is why we have human rights. This is why we have a justice system. This is why we have hospitals. This is why we value humans, is because they are inherently valuable because they're made in the image of God. Because they're made in the image of God, humans matter. Now, that's not to say that the rest of the nature is kind of like, you know, whatever, do, do whatever you will, you know? No, we'll see later on, God actually gives nature to us so that we can be stewards of it, so we can cultivate it, cultivate the potential. But I'm, I'm stealing my, future, uh, my the thunder from myself here, so I'll kind of rewind here back a little bit. But this is why humans are valuable, okay? Now, what does it mean to be in the image of God? If you were to look at a selfie of God and then look at my selfie, does that mean I look like God? <laughs> no, very far from it. My hairline. But uh, <laughs> don't laugh too hard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a good one. But uh, no, it's not a visual image. That's not what we're talking about here, okay? What does it mean to be in the image of God? Well, this has been debated back and forth for a very long time. However, what we're actually talking about here is that God took his attributes and put them in us, okay? So the like mental capacity, emotions, Okay? A spiritual capacity. These are things that God put into us. Not only that, but also as we look at this and we see God created the male and female, he took aspects of himself and created men, and then he took aspects of himself and created women. Okay? So together, men and women make up the image of God. Now, there's much more to unpack here, but I think this is probably the fact of the sermon for me here, okay? When I learned about this, this just blew my mind away. I couldn't believe it, okay? But back in this time, when kings ruled over territory, and the original audience would have caught this immediately when they heard, we're in the image of God, they would have been like, oh, clearly, that's what they're talking about. But when kings ruled a territory back then, they would make statues of themselves and they would put them in the cities that they were ruling in, but then also sometimes along the border of the territory that they're ruling to signify, I rule this land. I am in charge here. This is my dominion. Okay? So when God is saying we are made in God's image, then that's also saying we are representatives of God here on earth and we represent God's rule here on earth. That was so incredible to me to learn that literally God is saying, you represent my sovereignty here on earth. And if you think about it, as God invites humanity to follow him and to do what he's calling us to do, he's literally asking us to act on his behalf here on earth. Why is that? Because we're the image of God. We are his representatives here on earth. We symbolize literally God here on earth. Gosh, I could talk about this for days. I love it. I think it's so cool. But again, they would have instantly picked up on that, the original audience. But there's another thing to pick up here. And I think our culture is so quick to dismiss it. And it may be a little bit surprising to us. But God cares about our bodies. What do I mean by that? Well, God took so much care in time to create men and women, and we'll see that creation process here in a few seconds, but God created our bodies the way he wants them to be. And so sin is now in this world. It has now twisted things. And sometimes our bodies might get sick. Our bodies might not work the way we want them to. Our bodies might not feel the way we want them to. But at the end of the day, Our bodies are the way God wants them to be. God cares about this. Um, I mean, when Israel was in Egypt, one of the patriarchs says, 
look, I'm going to die here in Egypt, but when you go to the promised land, take my bones so that I can reside in Israel. Like, the, the, the emphasis that they put on the physical body, we're so quick to dismiss it because oftentimes we get this like stereotypical idea that God only cares about spirit and spiritual things. But that's not, a, that's not exactly what the Bible says. God cares about us spiritually, physically, mentally, because he created all of it. He created all of us, every aspect of us. But he made them the way he wanted them for a purpose. So next, God gives a blessing and a command to humanity, okay? So Genesis 1, 28, it says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on it. So here, where it says subdue, okay, that's like, okay, so when translating, it, you don't often get the exact same word one-to-one, -one, okay? So like, if you were to take a Spanish word, sometimes there's not an English word that fits that word, that doesn't fully translate. And so sometimes we have to make do with the limits of English, okay? Subdue, now, God's not saying put nature in a headlock and subdue it, you know, rule and reign over the earth. You know, that's not what God's saying here. What he's saying is you are stewards of the earth. You are to steward and to cultivate the potential. Like, there's potential here to grow food for so many people. There's potential to also enjoy the beauty of nature. And so us as humans, as we're seeing here, he basically put humans to begin with as gardeners on earth. And we're to cultivate that here because God built it with potential already built, built into it. And so God's like, man, I built you for this purpose. Go and do it. Go enjoy. Let's see what you can do. God's telling humans to, it is good to have kids, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth. And he's telling us that that's how we glorify him. That's how we worship is by being obedient, but going and doing what he says. God gives us food, a home here on earth, tells us to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and he gives us purpose and meaning. Okay? Genesis 1, 29 through 30. God also said, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for, uh, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, for every creature that crawls on earth, everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And so it was. And once God had done this, listen to what he says. Genesis 1, 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. This is the only day where God says, this is very good. All other times he's saying, hey, this is good. I like this. But then he made humans, and he says, this is very good. And it's intentional. And the author, Moses, the way he's writing this, he's highlighting this. In fact, when you look at the Hebrew, again, you know, it's similar to when they repeated things in threes. Um, there's just ways that they could write Hebrew that emphasize things. And so the way that it's written, the structure here, humanity is like the crown jewel of creation. Like God's like, I'm most proud of that. That, like everything's good, but that's very good. So speaking of structure here with Hebrew, if you are not aware of it, when you read Genesis 1 and 2, it can be kind of strange and confusing, okay? There's a lot of overlap between chapters 1 and 2. So chapter 1, we just saw, he created all of creation, animals, birds, fish, humans, and then he tells them what to do. He gives them purpose. He gives them food. But then you read chapter 2, and then it talks about how he created humans. And you're like, wait a second. I thought we already covered this. Well, what he's doing here is chapter one is a broad brushstrokes approach of showing you big picture what God did. 
And then chapter two is he's going in with a pencil and fine detail and showing you what God did. Okay? So let's go ahead and move on to chapter two. <clears throat> so chapter two, like I said, zooms in, shows more detail, a more detailed account of God creating humans, planting the Garden of Eden. But again, here, we're trying to focus on Adam and Eve. So we're going to go ahead and skip forward to verse 15 in chapter two. Okay? So chapter two, 15 through 18. Okay? So the Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. And the Lord commanded him, you're free to eat of any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day that you eat from it, well, you'll certainly die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. So Adam goes through all the animals and he names them. He gives them names and they're going through the list here. <clears throat> and no suitable, suitable helper is found. And in fact, it's almost like God's like, none of those animals work, did they? You don't have a companion. And Adam's like, what do I do? What's going on here? And God's like, I got a plan. So, Genesis 2, yeah, Genesis 2.20, the man gives names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, every wild animal, but for the, a man there was no helper found corresponding to him. So what does God do? Makes one. Genesis 2.21, verses 25, which this is funny, okay, with the creation of man, like God literally takes dust of the earth, breathes life into it. But then when he creates woman, the Hebrew that's used is more poetic. It's more beautiful as if God took more care to make women prettier than men, which I think that's a, you know, I think that's a fair conclusion. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 21 through 25. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at the place. The Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And he said, uh, and the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. So God created all the creatures, okay? No suitable helpmate was found for him. And so he creates Eve. Now, listen, <clears throat> listen carefully to the words coming up here in this next chapter, okay? So again, we're focusing on Adam and Eve. So we're going to skip to chapter 3 here. And chapter 3 opens to Adam and Eve, or excuse me, Eve speaking with a serpent, you know, as one does. Um, but there was a serpent speaking with Eve. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Did he really say that? Did he say you can't eat any tree in the garden? <clears throat> Already we see a twisting of words here, okay? Because what did God actually say? Did he say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No. I'm going to quote this for you. Genesis 2, 16 through 27 it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree tree of the garden. Any tree. If there's a tree in this garden, you're free, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day that you eat from it, certainly you'll die. Eve's reply is not so spot on here, okay? So Genesis 3, 2 through 3. The woman said to the serpent, we can eat the fruit from the trees of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat or touch of it or you will die. So to clarify here, 
God is saying, when you eat this fruit, like, it's going to be a certainty that you will die. But they're twi- the, the serpent's twisting it here, okay? And Eve's already letting it twist. She's like, oh, well, well God said when we eat it, like, you're going to drop dead, okay? So Genesis 3, 4 through 5, this is the serpent speaking. No, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What a subtle lie. The serpent's like slowly whispering, like, God's holding back on you. And you know what? Do you want to be like God? Because if you want to be like God, just eat this fruit. That's all you got to do. God's holding back on you. you. Do you really want to be lied to you? Do you really want God to hold back on you? Come on, you know better. Just eat this fruit. Come on. Okay? So it's very, you know, you can see the manipulation happening here, the twisting, okay? Which, if you take a step back, of course God's different than us. He is an infinite spiritual being, and we are a finite physical being, okay? Yes, we're different. But the lie takes root and and causes Eve to doubt God, to doubt his character, his goodness, and his intentions. Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. Okay, here, like the camera, I just imagine if it was like a video, the camera zooms out a little bit and mere inches away, there's Adam, okay? She took the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who evidently was just standing there and didn't say anything, who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, Another, <coughs> excuse me, another lie that the serpent likes to tell us, I don't know why this caught on, but it has, but it's another lie from the devil, from hell, that the fall of humanity is Eve's fault, that it's all women's fault. I don't understand where that comes from because Adam was there all along. According to the verses, he could have stepped in and been like, hey, Eve, th- listen, I don't know if we can talk to snakes, but like, let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's not eat this fruit. I this just then, oh, there it goes. This doesn't feel like a good idea. Let's not do this, okay? He easily could have stepped in. Hey, let's not grab the fruit here. Let, God said we could eat the avocados. We don't have to eat this. He could have stepped in and said anything, but instead... They were not listening to uh, God. They were listening to the serpent. So it was both Adam and Eve. It was both men and women. Like we're both at fault here. They gave into these doubts and they sinned against God. Again, we've talked about sin, how it's missing the target. God sets the target. God made us to be able to hit the target. And when we don't hit the target, that's sin. Okay? So, They ate it. They knew they had messed up. It was not a surprise to them. They immediately, they knew it. They knew they were naked. They were ashamed of it. They took fig leaves and made coverings for themselves. Next, we're told that they hear God walking in the garden and they hid from him. God calls out, where are you? As if he didn't already know exactly what happened. Adam and Eve finally come out and admit before God they were hiding because they were afraid because they were naked. Genesis 3, 11 through 13. God asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Again, as if God doesn't already know. The man replied, the, well, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. Oh, man. That's an intense answer there. So the Lord God asked, well, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So Adam is just blaming here, but Eve actually takes responsibility. And the Lord next turns to the serpent and he curses the serpent. 
And in that curse, he promises of a savior that would come and redeem all of humanity. So already, chapter 3, okay, uh, this is another important thing. We're actually not told how much time passes while in the Garden of Eden. So we don't know how much time had passed there. But in the Bible, it's three chapters. Three chapters in, humans, we done goofed. We dropped the ball, okay? But the third chapter in, God's already talking about Jesus and what he's going to come and do. Now, listen to this curse. This is really interesting. He curses the serpent. Uh, it's a few verses before this one, and it's not going to be on the screen. I apologize. But he curses the serpent to crawl on its belly for the rest of its life because, what it's, what it, because of what it has done. Isn't that what the snake already does? Interesting. So he curses the serpent, and he says, Genesis 3.15, I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, he's not saying Jesus, but he's talking about Jesus. This is the first promise of Jesus. This is the first time Jesus is prophesied by God. This is the very first time that this is mentioned. Again, the third chapter in, God has already got a plan on how to redeem humanity. God then turns to Eve and gives her consequences for sin, saying labor pains will be intensified while bearing children, and her desire will be for her husband, yet he will rule over her. And then he turns to Adam, and he tells him, because of his sin, his work in cultivating food in the field will be painful and difficult. The ground will now grow thorns and thistles, and when he dies, he will return to the ground as dust. After announcing these consequences over them, the Lord does something amazing. Okay, I did not pick this up. I think it was 20, either 2019 or 2020 when I read this. And it finally clicked with me. And I don't want it to go so long for you. I want you to catch this. Genesis 3, 21. The Lord made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. So on the surface, God clearly show, is showing care for them, and he gives them clothes. Because they, like, they sew together fig leaves, and God's like, guys, that's not going to cut it. So he makes animal skins. Well, he sacrifices an animal, takes the skins, and gives them clothing. He's like, this is going to work much better. Okay? So it shows care. God still loves Adam and Eve. He still cares for them. But also, if you read your Old Testament, God tells them in Old Testament law that when you sin, you have to make sacrifice for those sins. You have, they, Israel had to sacrifice an animal to cover up their sins. Whether they knew it was a sin, whether they didn't know it was a sin, like they had, blood has to be spilled to cover up sin, okay? Now, recognize what I said there, to cover up sin. It does not deal with sin with finality. The only thing that can wipe away sin with like, a, in a final sense is what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus' blood is the only thing that can wipe away our sin. So God here, in this one short little verse, I don't think he gets enough credit, God not only made clothes for them because he cares about them, wants them to have better fitting clothes that's going to cover them up, but also God has sacrificed an animal that their sins may be covered up. So again, we're seeing a promise of Jesus God's grace towards humanity here by covering up their sin for them. God's love abounds in the Old Testament and in Genesis. And then finally, God casts Adam and Eve out of the garden. So look with me, Genesis 3, 22 through 24. The Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim, which is an angel, okay? It's a, it's a title of an angel. And a flaming, whirling sword 
east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. So he banishes them out of Eden and he stations an angel to act as a guard to the entrance of the garden so they cannot come back. So as you can see, the first three chapters of Genesis here are jam-packed. And again, a surface level reading, you miss a lot of it. But there's even more that I didn't even cover here because I we're running out of time. But there's so much in here. It sets the stage for the human condition, which is sin. That's our problem. We're sinners. We were made by a perfect God who cannot be before sin. Sin is our problem. It tells us, Genesis tells us why the world is broken. Why the world is just not the way it's supposed to be. It also shows us that not all hope is lost. That there's still good in the world because God is still good. Because God is still involved here on earth. The promised snake crusher, Jesus, did come and he did strike the serpent, killing it with a fatal blow. Now it's still limping along today. But Jesus came and conquered our sin. He conquered death by death. Jesus paid our debt on the cross, taking all physical, mental, and spiritual pain and anguish on our behalf so that we can stand before God clean. God is good in all that he does. So how does this apply to us? Well, my first question for you would be, where do you stand with God? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Or are you still wearing fig leaves? Do you have animal skin, so to speak, that God has given us? Have you had your sin wiped away? Do you know that God loves you and wants what's best for you? Because if you don't, golly, I say it every week. That's why we started the church. Come talk to me after service. Perhaps you're saved. And if you're saved, do you keep track of what you think about God? A good diagnostic question to ask yourself is, how do you think God feels about you? And that can kind of reveal maybe some lies that you're believing about God. Maybe the serpent has slowly been whispering into your ear and you've bought into it and, and you're not lined up with scripture. You're not looking at God the way that scripture defines him. Are you listening to the lies or are you listening to God's truth in his word? I know I sound like a broken record every week, but this is why it's so vital to be reading the Bible that you would know what God asks of us, but then also you know the promises of God, his faithfulness, his goodness. It's vital to be reading God's word. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer this morning. And after I'm done praying, Angel is going to lead us in one more song of worship because there's no better time to worship God than after hearing his word. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you and I praise you so much for your word. God, I thank you for how it stirs in our hearts. It stirs us to, to greater obedience to you, Lord God. But also, these promises that you've given us bring so much comfort to us. God, your word, uh, it's Psalm 19, it says that your word brings light to our eyes that we'd be more sensitive to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be drawing us to your word, that we would be, that we would be following after you. We wouldn't be following the lies of this world and of the serpent, Lord. Father, all these things I pray in your name. Amen.